homeless man who was also a Vietnam veteran stands on a street corner holding up a sign for all passing drivers to see. His sign says, out of work, homeless, hungry, please help. How many here have seen him? As he stands there, a woman approaches him on the sidewalk. She has tears in her eyes and she's holding a piece of paper, a poster-sized piece of paper. And she explains to this uh, poor man that she has no money to give him. But she shows him her missing person poster that has a photo of her missing daughter. The daughter's been missing for over two weeks. She asks the homeless man if he has seen her in his daily time on the streets. The man apologizes and says, no, ma'am, but I will keep my eyes open and be on the lookout for her. The woman gives him a copy of the missing person photo of her daughter. They hug each other. Two hurting souls in deep pain, two hurting souls, both needing a miracle. Several minutes later, after the woman has left, the homeless man puts down his sign, his need out of work sign, and he picks up the photo, the photo and the missing person ad, and he puts it in front of the passing drivers. With tears in his eyes, he holds up for the passing drivers to see this girl who's missing. And he does so for the next several hours, and he does so for the next day going forward. The Bible says in John 11:35. And Jesus wept. Now, granted, in context, in that scripture, Jesus is, this is referring to Jesus' uh, reaction to his close friends, Mary and Martha, at the loss of their brother, Lazarus. And he sees the pain and suffering they're going through. And the Bible says Jesus wept. But I believe that Jesus still weeps. He weeps today over the homeless, over grieving parents, and missing children. I also believe that Jesus weeps tears of joy over human love, kindness, goodness, and compassion. Mark Twain once said this, love and kindness is the language that the deaf can hear and the blind can see. This morning's story is a story of love, kindness, goodness, and compassion. It is, about, it is about King David and a boy named Mephibosheth. Most of us know the big stories of David in the Bible, right? We know David being anointed as king. We know about David and Goliath. We know about David's fleeing of Saul and having a chance to wrestle the, the crown from Saul, but he holds back until God's time. We know about David's heart of worship. We know of David bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. We know of David's desire to build God's temple only to be told no by God and that his son Solomon would. We know of David's sin with Bathsheba and his ultimate repentance and confession. We know of the Davidic covenant between God and Israel that someday the eternal king would come out of the line of David and that is Jesus and finally, when we think of David, we think of the scripture that refers to him as a man after God's own heart. But who here this morning is familiar with the story of Mephibosheth? Okay, that, that is great. Great story, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning, because this story, as we listen carefully about David and Mephibosheth, I think we'll hear our story as well. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Samuel Chapter 9, and we're going to be reading the first eight verses, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. 2 Samuel 9, 1 through 8. David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They called him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? Your servant, he replied. The king asked, is there, still, is there no one still left of the house of Saul 
to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he? the king asked. Ziba answered, He is at the house of Makur, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. So David had him brought, before, brought from Lodabar from the house of Makur, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down and paid him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? May God bless the reading of his word. So who is Mephibosheth? We're told earlier in the Bible, in 2 Samuel, that he is King Saul's, um, it's King Saul's grandson, or Jonathan's son, whom David had as a best friend in childhood. And we're told that he was lame in both feet. We don't know much about Mephibosheth, but we know this. The scripture tells us that when he was five years old, Mephibosheth was five years old, when his nurse took him up and fled after a battle that killed both Jonathan and King Saul. And it happened as she quickly fled that she either dropped the child in her care or the child fell and he became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth is the crippled son of Jonathan, David's closest childhood friend. But understand this, when David asked the question in our scripture this morning, Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth had already lived 15 years alone, in fear, unaware that kindness, goodness, mercy, compassion, and grace awaited him. There are three points of reflection this morning as we looked at the scripture. The first is this. I believe we must seek and see the Mephibosheths of this world. There's a 1965 song that says these words. There are mountains and hillsides enough to climb. There are oceans and rivers enough to cross, enough to last till the end of time. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. When this song was written, the United States was in a time of turmoil. There was civil unrest, there was, there was divisiveness, there was bitter hatred, there was war. And still today, 56 years later, there's still divisiveness, unrest, bitterness, and divisiveness. So what the world will always need is love, kindness, and compassion. John 13, 34 commands us as Christians, hear Jesus' words, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. I think David is an Old Testament prime example of this love, kindness, and goodness. And it's not coincidental that David went seeking for someone who needed kindness. It just didn't happen. It just didn't fall in his life. He desired to reconcile with anyone from his enemy's family, from King Saul's family, if they were still alive. It was intentional. Who are the Mephibosheths of this world? We know who they are. They're the disabled vets, the elderly who are forgotten in nursing homes. They are the poor and homeless on our street corners, holding up signs, asking for money. They are the single moms, they are young youth who are runaways. They are the young pregnant girls disgraced and abandoned by their own families. The youth sitting alone in jails in our justice system. They are our neighbors. And as Jesus said, anyone in need. There are also our own family and friends who are separated, who need reconciliation. Broken homes, families that aren't even talking to each other, such as David and Mephibosheth. So we too, we too, must seek out and help those hurting 
in a lost and dying world. The second point of reflection this morning. When we see Mephibosheths in our dying world, we must be people of action, love, and kindness. Like David, we must be people of words and actions. Praying and talking about it is a great starting point. But we also must take the next step. Maybe it's through phone calls, visits, volunteering, donations, donations of our money, time, and talents. That's what's needed. Serving others in Christ's name for God's glory, not a pat on the back to us. That's the Christian call in all of our ministry. It's all of our responsibility. We must demonstrate unity, acceptance, restoration, kindness. We need to bring reconciliation to a messed up world. We need to be able to raise up people's dignity and self-esteem. We must be peacemakers. It is said that Kingdom Joy, the acronym J-O-Y, is best experienced using that acronym when our priority is first, J is for Jesus, then O for others, and then yourself. That's bringing kingdom joy. When we look at David's example of grace in verse 7, we see that David showed kindness. David restored and gave land back to Mephibosheth that was not his. David restored restored Mephibosheth's wealth, family, honor, and status. And David offered him equality at his table and in his home. There's a passage in Galatians that talks about, Paul talks about the fruits of the Spirit. The four verses there, verses 19 through 23, say this. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And then Paul goes on to say, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And this, these are the words of gold that Paul adds and finishes this passage. He says in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things, there is no law. So the question I think we ask ourselves this morning is what kind of fruit are we growing in our lives? What kind of fruit are we growing in our lives? Is it love? Is it kindness? Is it goodness? Those are a few of the fruits that led me to consider this morning's message in the story of David and Mephibosheth. The fruits of the Spirit tell us many things, but three things in particular from that Galatians passage that strike out to me is that The kingdom of God is not a kingdom of this world. It's not Democrat, it's not Republican, it's not black, it's not white. It's without, it is without country ethnicity, and it is without borders. It is male, it is female, it is age independent. The fruit, secondly, the fruits of the Spirit tell us as believers that we are to march to a different drummer, so to speak, and away from those acts. Horrible acts of the flesh that Paul mentions back in Galatians. And thirdly, the fruits of the Spirit tell us this. We're to desire, we are to learn, we're to develop these fruits in an active and maturing, and we are to surrender to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We're to build our spiritual muscles like we build our physical strength. We must exercise the fruits to have them become strong, and plentiful. The third and final point this morning I'd like to make is this. We need to realize that the Mephibosheth in the mirror is us. And know that what David did for Mephibosheth, God did for us. Think about that. What David did for Mephibosheth, God does for us. And it's called mercy and it's called grace. Mephibosheth saw himself as a dead dog, unworthy of the king's favor. 
But yet Mephibosheth was a recipient of David's favor, unmerited love, something he didn't deserve or um, expect. He was a recipient of David's grace. Mephibosheth lived 15 years, unaware of the goodness and kindness and grace that awaited him. How many years did you and I live like a dead dog, angry, impatient, on edge, stressed by the circumstances of life before we knew the grace of God? As a relative of of the dethroned King Saul, Mephibosheth thought death was always right around the corner. And likewise, until until we respond to the grace of God, spiritual death is always around the corner from us. We too are servants of the Lord Jesus, sons and daughters of the Master, and we too have been invited to eat at the Master's table forever. I like what a Bible commentator that I researched this week said about this passage. Richard E. Zell says this, When finally we lay trembling at Jesus' feet, he touched us and said, Don't be afraid. He lifted us up and said, I'm going to give back to you everything you ever lost because of sin. I'm going to give you an inheritance, blessings, and riches in the heavenly places. But more than that, I want you forever in my presence, eating at my table, and I'm going to call you my child. What what David did for Mephibosheth, God does for us. Mercy and grace. Just as the king brought the outcast into the palace and made him a son, God adopts us into his family. You and I are Mephibosheths too. Before we came to accept Jesus, we spent our lives distancing ourselves from God the Father because of our brokenness, our sin, our spiritual illness, our lameness. I'm going to finish with this short story. It's a true story. 1988. An 11-year-old boy named Leroy Sutton from the projects of Cleveland, Ohio, was walking to school along railroad tracks. He slipped and he was pinned under some of those loose railroad ties. He was hit and run over by the train. He survived, but he lost both legs. Now fast forward seven years. Seven years later, we're in a high school gym at a high school wrestling match. Another student named D'Artagna Crockett, a member of the wrestling team, enters the gym. Now know this about D'Artagna. D'Artagna is homeless, he's hungry, and know this, he's legally blind, and he's a high school wrestler. As he enters the gym, perched on top of his back, and riding on his back was a wrestling teammate, Leroy Sutton. The boy previously run over by that train. Leroy traveled around up there on D'Artagnan's back, and both Leroy and D'Artagnan, in their poverty and in their disabilities, were now high school wrestling teammates. They were both Mephibosheths. In their poverty and in their physical barriers, though, God sent them what I would call a Mephibosheth rescuer. Lisa Fenn, a six-time Emmy award-winning feature producer with ESPN, who had interviewed the likes of Michael Jordan, Tom Brady, and others, but she says that her interview of these two young men changed her life. They were the most rewarding, and it was the most rewarding encounter and interview that she ever did. But it was more than just the interview that Lisa did. Lisa stuck around With this 2009 interview that I just talked about with Leroy and D'Artagnan, she developed a serious, close-knit family friendship relationship with each of them. And And then she helped raise funds to help them through their poverty and disabilities. Their story reached the world, and people responded giving generously with love, kindness, and goodness to these two Mephibosheths in need. The rest of the story, Leroy, who never in his wildest dreams ever dreamed of going to college, went on and graduated from college and became a video game 
designer. D'Artagnan went on to the 2012 Paralympic Olympics in London and won the bronze medal. The two keepers I think we need to walk away from this morning's message from God is this. There are, there are Mephibosheths all around us. Those who need help. Those who also need to have their self-esteem raised. Dignity reclaimed. Restoration. Mercy. Grace. Mercy and grace will always prevail when people of God act in love, kindness, and goodness. And as people of Jesus, we must see and we must act. The second keeper, we are the Mephibosheths in our own mirror. And may we too be found equally as grateful, loyal, and as loving servants of the king as was the man who was lame in both feet, named Mephibosheth. Thank God for his great mercy, his great love, his grace, his kindness, his goodness, and most of all, a seat at the Lord's table. So let's look carefully in the mirror and let's pay attention in our lives and really see all the Mephibosheths. And let's be Jesus to a, heart, to a hurting and dying world. Let's walk with the King today and let you and I be that blessing. And to this I say, amen. And may God bless. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is so, so hard to imagine the pain that others suffer when things are going so well in our own lives. But Father, give us the eyes to see. Give us the minds and hearts to act, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to the Mephibosheths in a dying world around us. And Father, make us eternally grateful, loyal to you for what you've done for us. Mercy and grace and a seat at your table. Thank you, Father. We love you. Thank you for speaking to our hearts and our minds. May we go in peace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.